Hello, everybody. This is Joe DePrisco. I'm the chair of the Simpson Literary Project and uh, here with Daniel Mason, who is the 2020 Joyce Carol Oates Prize winner uh, of the Simpson uh, Literary Project. He succeeds Layla Lalami, who was the 2019 winner, Anthony Morrow, the 2018 winner, and Geronimo Johnson, the 2017 winner. And the Joyce Carol Oates Prize is given to a writer in the middle of a, a, a burgeoning career, a mid-career author. Someone, the way we like to put it, someone who's emerged and still emerging. And uh, we, uh, the rigorous process we went through to consider uh, all our applicants, all, all the nominations confidentially from around the country, there was uh, no question that Daniel Mason was most deserving and we're so happy that he's going to be the 2020 Joyce Carol Oates Prize winner for the project. Hi, Daniel. Hey, Joe. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for the introduction. Good. And this is a, it, it's a wonderful thing that, to have Daniel. He's, his new book is, which you won't be able to see, I guess, is a Registry of My Passage Upon the Earth, a new collection of stories. Uh, after his uh, amazing, award-winning, much garlanded novel, The Winter Soldier. So uh, we, um, we're going to talk a little bit about everything, I hope, in the next uh, few minutes. But uh, so, Daniel, you spent some time at Berkeley at the, at the Townsend Center. Can you right. talk a little bit about your time there and what, what went on? Sure, sure. So um, let's see, this was back in, you know, I want to say, maybe 2004, 2005. And I had graduated from medical school. Um, I had begun writing fiction when I was in, in medical school and then ended up, after I graduated, deciding that I wanted to just you know, try, writing, try writing something else and, and see what it was like to just, to just write. And, and so um, it was around that time I, um, that I was invited to, to go to be in the uh, Spanish and, and Portuguese department. Um, and English department, sort of a, a, a joint visit at the at the Townsend at the Townsend Center, Spanish and, and, and Portuguese, um, because I, because I had gotten to know Candace Slater, professor in um, Portuguese, Brazilian literature, Brazilian culture, um, while working on my second book, <clears throat> which was um, set in uh, northeastern Brazil. Um, not I don't I never name it, but, but based on experiences in northeastern Brazil. Right. And so I so I'd, I'd gone to, to Berkeley then and um, ended up you know, being a, a Townsend Fellow for for that, that period of time, but but just falling in love with Berkeley and um, and and the coffee houses and and the campus and the libraries, and so ended up becoming in some ways I think a, a character that's very familiar on the Berkeley campus, which is you know a person who sort of inhabits that space without any uh, <laughs> official official appointment means of support. <laughs> Right, that's right. So, so I was, yeah, you know, I, I would go to uh, biology lectures and in, you'd sit in on classes. I took a plant identification class. And I did all sorts of um, unemployed activities while while I was there. But I ended up living in Berkeley for I think six, seven years. Oh and, my goodness! Oh my goodness! Um, I, did, all, I didn't realize the, that. Yeah, all in the shadow of the the university. Uh, uh, and, and, and Berkeley is a huge place and a very diverse uh, population and. Lots of wonderful people there. Uh, very different from Stanford, maybe. Yeah. Very, very different from your undergraduate experience, perhaps. I, you know, I think Berkeley, Berkeley feels more. Um, the campus is more in the in the mix. It's it's more part of the city, and the, the boundaries to the community seem more fluid. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Stanford really feels like classically Stanford's the farm, and and right. even though Palo Alto and everything sort of grown up around here. There's all this open space around right. around us, and, and that's one thing I just I loved about about Berkeley was, um, you know, I mean, in the sense that I lived a quarter mile away and would walk onto campus and then off campus and, and sort of existed on the on the boundary between the between the the, the the two worlds. So, as as you know, Daniel, the the project is founded in partnership between the University of California Berkeley English Department and the Lafayette Library Learning Center Foundation and with new partners, and we've been in existence now for five years, and we're growing. And so we're, um, uh, so, the, so but the, the Berkeley thing, I was, I was conscious of 
reading this, the marvelous story that ends, the title story, uh, mm -hmm. Registry of My Passage Upon the Earth. That is, I mean, one of the weird angles here, of course, is the, 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 the main figure in this story is Arthur Beppo, right? Is that a bit, but, yeah, Bispo. Uh, Bispo. Bispo, like, like who, Bispo. yeah, who's, yeah. who's, yeah, are you, um, and he is an amazing art. Are you familiar with Creative Growth in, in downtown Oakland? A absolutely. Yeah. It's a great so, place. It's a great place. Yeah. I used to go there when I lived in, when I lived in Berkeley. Right. So here he is doing these amazing things and he's a, a, a mentally uh, rearranged kind of artist. Um, mm -hmm. But he's also a boxer, a champion boxer. Uh -huh. Well, what's interesting to me is your first story is about the stevedore having you know this amazing boxing match so your stories begin with a boxer and end with a boxer right and i think well this is one of joyce's favorite themes boxing right. and i can't help but i always remember when i think about boxing i think about what mike tyson said uh about fighting him he says yeah everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth and i'm wow. thinking <laughs> so there's something about that combat right that attracted you there's uh -huh. that that can you say something about that sure sure you, you know um so the i mean i wasn't i hadn't realized he was a boxer when i first started writing it and, and that was the first story in the collection and that came about because i was in brazil i was traveling around the northeast i was in this tiny dusty little town where um where there really wasn't sort of anything suggesting modernity there there was the house was probably looked the way that they looked like a you know, hundred years ago and I just happened into the cultural center there where they had this poster of this man in this fantastic outfit that he'd embroidered himself and um, I just I thought it looked it was wonderful and it looked actually like a patient of mine in San Francisco who used to huh. adorn himself with um, pieces of traffic signs um, to create these incredible, incredible outfits mm -hmm. and, and so when I asked who he was they, they said well this was this is sort of the most famous guy from Japaratuba which is the name of the town um, his name is his name is Arthur Bispo, and he ended up um, being in a monocomio, like an asylum in Rio de Janeiro. I think this great story, like he's right. the most famous guy from this town, and he ended up being in an asylum in Rio. And so then I, I began to read about him, and he had this, he had this belief that that um, God had selected him um, to create a um, a registry of what it's like to be a human being, um, to be presented to God on Judgment Day, and this meant um, creating. You're showing God what kind of buttons existed on Earth, what kinds of cars existed, kind of signals, because he was in the Navy, signals the Navy used. So all of these, um, all, you know, this this collection of what it's what it's like to be in the world, this really attracted to me. This this um, compulsion that he had to create these works of art to to share um, this vision um, with, with this with this God that he imagined was commanding him. Then I was as I was reading it, I came out. It came out in, in a couple of biographies that, that they have about him, and really there, there was very much very little written of him at, at the time um, that he had that he had been a boxer. He spoke of boxing. Um, there are some mentions in the asylum records that he had been a boxer. So I included that in the early early draft of the story, and then and then I went on, um, you know, to write some more. I ended up writing this other boxing story about these guys in, in Regency era England. Um, right. you, and, and year, anyway, years passed. And so this collection was coming together and I was re-editing the stories and I felt like, you know, a long time, I mean, 15 years have passed since I wrote about Arthur Bispo. I wonder if anything is new is known about him. What else is out there in the world? And so it turns out multiple volumes have been written on him since. And very recently, like within the last couple of years or so, someone had decided to go look into the old Rio de Janeiro sporting papers um, to see if they could find any record of him. The way I had understood the literature beforehand was, this guy Beethbo says he was a boxer, um, but you know, he's living in an asylum. He's been diagnosed with severe mental illness. I'm not exactly sure whether we should credit this story 100%. Person goes into the archives and turns up not only records of him fighting, but front sports page photographs of wow. him with a fist up. Wow. Um, talking about in the same way that boxers talk nowadays about you know I'm gonna I'm gonna beat so and so <laughs> up I'm gonna knock him to the mat they gonna have a taste of my fist <laughs> doing exactly the same thing back mm -hmm. in you know back in Rio in the in the in the I guess 40s or 50s mm -hmm. um, no this would have been in in, in the 30s um, and it was just it's wonderful to to see this man who I had imagined 
um, fictionally all of a sudden appearing um, in his young, healthy self um, in his, and, and having his story justified um, a, and, a, and, and confirmed. So it became a much bigger part of the, of the re revision. Well, it's marvelous stuff. I mean, there's so many marvelous stories here. And uh, I mean, I don't want to get too writer conferencey with you, but you know, these stories gestated over a long period of time. Uh, but to go a little bit into the writer conferencey thing, so I mean, novel versus short story. Uh, I mean, what what leads you to one form or the other? A lot of people say, well, the short story is more like a poem than it is a novel. Uh, uh, Randall Jarrell f famously de defined a novel, you probably know about this, as it's a piece of fiction of some length with which something is very wrong. And, huh. <laughs> so, okay. and, and I, I, I thought about that a lot when writing a memoir. I said, well, a memoir is a piece of nonfiction of some length with which something is wrong with the writer. But that's another story. That's a whole wow. other thing. Right, but, right. but anyway, so write, story, short story versus novel, uh, where, where are you on that? Do you, do you just write when you write? I, I mean, a lot of times it comes down to that. And I think then afterwards, I, I, I'm kind of guessing why something happened the way it happened. Um, I mean, for, you know, it takes a lot of courage to, to embark on a novel. I mean, what happened when, when the Winter Soldier took, I think, 14, 15 years from beginning yeah. to end. Yeah, amazing, and, amazing story. So um, it was, it was, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with, with the book in the end, but there were periods of time during that. You know, whenever you hear writers say something took 14 years, like those aren't like sort of happy <laughs> years of just like rejoicing in the creative process. Um, I mean, one can do the math and see sort of like how many minutes were devoted to each word. So, so there's a lot of throwing out. And, and I think that, that um, you know, so, so I, I, and, and same thing happened with my second novel. Um, yeah maybe reasonably common stories. I sort of stumbled into the first novel. It was mm -hmm. a lot of fun. It was something I didn't feel like I was supposed to be doing. So there was a thrill to it. And then um, and it came out relatively quickly, relatively easily. Second, third book um, are um, all of a sudden it's a job and, and, and one sort of feels the presence of a reader and, and um, the pressure of it, of it being a job. And, and so I certainly felt that with, with a winter soldier. So I think that, that sort of shaped my approach towards novels. I, right, right now, I have an idea for a novel. Um, things have been changed since, since the pandemic came about, but I, I'm being quite cautious as to when I started and feeling like what's there is, is, is going to be um, close to sort of the direction that I want to go. I think because I have this, this example from, from beforehand. Short stories, though, they're much more playful because the, because the commitment isn't one's you know, years and years of one's life, um, the project, I feel like I'm much more willing to pick something, run with it for a few days or a few weeks, see where it goes. And if it doesn't work, then you know, it, it's not, not, not the end of the world. As a result, I, I have much more fun with them. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think I'm drawn a little bit more actually to, to writing them. Um, well, it's, it's interesting that this, there's so many different s styles and structures in the stories. I mean, uh, you're into fabulism, there's realism, there's super realism. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's a great range. But, but going back to The Winter Soldier just for a second. So it's been called historical fiction. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that term means anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not so sure either, right? <laughs> what, is, what isn't historical fiction? <laughs> right, right. I guess I don't know. futuristic writing or science fiction. Well, yeah, what do they call that? Uh, speculative fiction. Speculative yeah, fiction. Yeah, I still don't know what that means either, since all fiction is speculative too. So here, so, but when you think, so people want to say, well, it's historical fiction is shedding some light on, on the past, but of course history is never uh -huh. in the past. Right. Um, so when you were composing over the 14 years, those 14 glorious years, writing the novel, uh, did you, was there a case you were trying to make about our contemporary world by, by implication perhaps when you're talking about medical practices or about even the, 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 the hot button subjects that comes up all the time in discussions with you about shell shock versus post-traumatic stress disorder. 
Um, uh -huh. I mean, were, were you trying to gain a purchase on the present by writing about World War I? Yeah, I think that if I was trying to get a purchase on, on something in the present, it, it was I mean, sort of motivating like what the story was about for me was what, what is it like to, to, to become a physician um, and, to, and to feel the responsibility and um, the, the sort of elation and thrill of the responsibility, but then also the kind of consequences that could come along with that. So and as, as I was writing it, like, I would constantly come back to it, sort of like remind myself, like, you know, ultimately what I'm trying to explore is this, this idea. And, and in a way that's what you know, kicked much of the book off was thinking about my time early in training. I mean, even now, these moments where, um, you know, where um, this, you know, both both the thrill as well as sort of the terror of the responsibilities that taking care of someone else entail come into play. And so, so I think it was exploring that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel, you know, fortunately, my life has not been as dramatic and interesting as my protagonist's life. I mean, that's all all of us, I'd say. So maybe different writing a, me a memoir, right? That's probably a different kind of experience, but we never really want to have as interesting a life as our, as our protagonist. No, no. So, as, my, as my doctor says, you never want to be an interesting patient. <laughs> right, you never, want to, you never want to be an interesting character. You never want to be an interesting so, yeah, yeah so, so, so I think that, um, so, but, 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 so it was important to choose a period of time which would uh, cast the questions that I was looking into, uh, into a little bit of a harsher, harsher and, and, and more dramatic life. I, I, as I read about it, I, I found that there was a language um, about the, of the period, in particular medical language of the period, that had its own poetry that I, that I wanted to explore, um, a language of bureaucracy that I thought was fascinating. Um, the, the, the visual images of the period were really striking and, and, and just kind of you know, a, a pleasure to roll around in for a while. And, and so, but I wouldn't say that was motivated. I didn't, I didn't start out saying, like, I really want to write, like, a Cossack uh, battle scene in, in, there is a good horse scene book. there's a great horse scene in there though <laughs> <laughs> but once it was there i thought wow this is fun i get to write a horse yeah thanks but there's a lot about lucius's uh i don't know class consciousness i mean being a doctor lucius uh -huh. was was not a big step up uh, right. in terms of class back then and who gets to be his, his greatest teacher turns out to be sister Margar marguerite is i think the way you pronounce her name yeah, that, you know, it's, it's funny, right? It, it is fascinating. We, we have these private pronunciations, I think, for all, all, of, our, all of our characters, right? <laughs> we sort of walk through life with a private relationship with our character. That's actually how I always called her. And then um, it occurred to me, like, at a certain point in time that if, if she had a Polish name, a real Polish name, and, and Margareta was, was her German name, um, that it would be pronounced Margareta. Uh, mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I had this moment where I thought, oh, my God, you know, all the pacing of the book, all of the, you know, every single sentence, right, that involves her name, is it going to be changed because, because of uh, the, the existence of this addition, additional syllable? But in my own mind, she still kind of reminds, remains, you know, Margaret or Margaret. Like if I talk well, to her about somebody else, I often will say that. What well, an mind. amazing character she is. She and her man liquor, right? At the, uh, yeah. uh, at the door and the lice and everything is astonishing. And to Tony Mara wrote your wonderful review, former. JCO Prize winner, wrote a wonderful review in the Times, in which he said, I, I think he put it something like this. Some people might call this an old-fashioned novel. I call it timeless, uh -huh. and which was a nice thing to say. Very and nice. I yeah. think true. I think very true. Thanks. So, uh, so let's, let's talk a little bit about, well, let me ask you this question, a big question here. So you're, you're a psychiatrist. Uh, is writing therapeutic? Is reading therapeutic? Sure. I guess it depends on the writing, depends on the, <laughs> <laughs> depends on the reading. Um, you know, it, um, it depends. I mean, there's many forms of writing that are therapeutic. It's very therapeutic. Um, and I'm, I'm aware, I mean, this has even been studied that, that anyone even sees, you know, during the, the, the this COVID crisis, uh, a friend of mine, shared to me what his health insurance company um, sent him an email saying that he should be journaling, which is hilarious because he's, he's a writer, um, a poet, and, and, and I mean, he thought it was a riot because you know, now, now, his, now his, you know, 
corporate um, health insurance company, tri-state corporate insurance company, um, is telling him that he should he should be writing. So, but you know, they're getting at something, right? That there's a literature that um, put, putting words to a page can be um, organizing and, and therapeutic. I mean, it, it can also be immiserating, as as generation of writers would would tell you. So right. I, I don't think if one is seeking. If one is seeking mental health, I probably wouldn't recommend going into writing as as a career, um, given given the, the tensions that come along with it. But but I think on a daily basis, um, writing as a, as a, any is is a very sort of wholesome and, 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 and rich kind of expression. I usually well, will. Yeah, I don't know what's like for you. I, I mean, I will I'll alternate. I'll feel you know anxious or worried, and and, and I'll write and I'll feel much better. But but. But then, then I'll read what I wrote and I feel much worse. <laughs> but I, I go back and forth. The next day. <laughs> right. That's well, right. I mean, the romantic project was all about, you know, the madness of the, of the, of the author. I mean, and it becomes a, kind of a sacred calling to be kind of insane, the ancient mariner or whatever. Uh, Wordsworth, uh, Shelley, all the romantic poets. So, I mean, there's a madness um, that, uh, well, and there's your course, teaching uh, psychosis and literature. Right. Um, by the way, what are you reading? I want to go into that in a second, but what are you reading these days? I, I, I think I heard a rumor about what, what you've been reading on your own these days. Well, let's see. So I've gone um, back and forth. It's funny, when the, when the epidemic started out, I found reading fiction really, really hard. Hmm. Um, I mean, so at first I started out by reading, I think probably like everyone else, returning to the plague narratives. So like looking at Journal of My Plague Year, which I found at first thrilling. I, I tried to read Defoe several times in the past, and I'll be honest, could not engage with the story, couldn't kind of, kind of figure out why he was bringing particular details in and, and hadn't finished it. And then I started to read it after this started and thought, oh my God, is this speaking to me? This is, you know, he's yeah. describing my world, he's enriching my world. And then at a certain point, I actually found that it was almost a little bit too much, like needing a, bre a break from this. Too much detail, you mean? You know, it's just too, like, the, like the, this, and I'd open up the times in the morning and I'd see, Know, suffering and 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 things to be afraid of, and then I'd open up to foe and I'd read of suffering and and things to be afraid of, and um, I, I just needed some space space from it. So I started returning. So one of the stories in the collection is about Arthur or Alfred Russell Wallace, right? Great story. Discovery of of evolution, and and I had absolutely loved the Malay Archipelago when I read it um, years ago when I wrote that story. So I actually went back to the Malay Archipelago and then to another one of his books called My Life, about one of his biographies. And then I had never read Voyage of the Beagle. So I ended up reading Voyage of the Beagle, um, which, which is like a great book to read um, during stay-at-home orders because he, he has this, um, this categorist's approach, the scientist's approach of letting you know what he's seeing, the plants and animals that he's seeing. And... Um, those that I didn't know, I could look up, and it was like, you know, seeing someone painting a picture um, of um, in the areas in Patagonia and and, and um, the coast of Chile where he's tra traveling. So, uh, um, so travel narratives for a while sustained me. Now, now I find I can read fiction again. I'm reading the short stories of um, Lucia Berlin right now. She's great, isn't she great? She's great. She's great. She's great. She's really great. And they're very they're Berkeley stories. Like Hell yes. <laughs> Um, so I think that's a wonderful part of it. Like she talks about being in a laundromat and I'm thinking, God, I remember that laundromat. <laughs> right on Shattuck there, right? Shattuck and uh, Cedar, right is there? It is it possible? Mine used to be the college, the college laundromat. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, but I'm sure the Berkeley, la what, what goes on in the Berkeley laundromat is probably a trans. Everything goes on. <laughs> that's right, trans Berkeley phenomenon. <laughs> so uh, psychiatry and literature, just been a hot subject for a long time in the 60s. I mean, 60s and 70s. How many dissertations were written uh, from a psychoanalytic point of view? None by me, but uh -huh. uh, I mean, the, the writers who were writing about literature and psychiatry and R.D. Lang and uh, Thomas Saz and uh, uh, Norman O. Brown, people like that. Well, those, R.D. Lang, I think has been suitably discredited since then. He sort of lionized the insane or the, or the, the schizophrenic as a form of uh, heroism. I mean, that's the latest reading on him. But this would be, so you're teaching a course on psychosis and literature. It would be, and, well, and Freud. Freud, is, Freud has, been, is, has come up for re-examination with a, with a fury these days. 
Like, where are you on all these all these debates going on about the uh, psychiatry and the psychoanalysis? I'll take my answer off the air. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> how, how long? How long do you have? Yeah. I feel like um, a lot of times with with the course, I, I always feel like I have to sort of the conversation can hit off in so many directions that that I'll often find myself sort of re bringing the class back down to sort of the core mission of this class, which is to, to learn more about the phenomenological experience of psychosis by using literary texts. Uh, yeah. And the students who are wonderful you know, will, will you know, bring in so much from, else from the outside. And, and you know, fortunately, there is some time to, to digress a, a bit. But, but even just the, just the simple question of, of what, what are these experiences like um, is, is an immense one. And, and the goal, psych psychosis of historically has been identified as an un understandable experience, which is actually part of the core definition of delusion by Carl Jaspers 100 years ago, was that, you can't, that there's something in there you can't understand. And that un understandability is, is, is what makes it so. And, and so the course sort of picks that up as a challenge and says, well, maybe it's possible for us to use literary texts as a way of of um, of approaching it, I mean, how, how can it's hard to understand anybody? But and, and yes, this experience is hard. But maybe we can use these texts in which um, we have both nonfiction and fictional accounts of experiences like hallucinations or or delusions, and maybe that can bring us closer to understanding what it might be like. Well, it's interesting too. You can see in Robert Lowell or Delmore Schwartz, people like that. You can see actually these these manias, uh, Theodore Rutke. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see them actually, did I say low? Low. I mean, you can right. see them them all sort of happening in real time. Uh -huh. How they're decompensating and disassociating right on the page. Right. Uh, which is, you know, amazing to read, fascinating to read. So I was, I was interested to see that you taught uh, Vladimir's Nabokov's uh, Symbols and Signs. Right. Which, which he later changed to signs and symbols or earlier, I forget what it was, yeah. which is an amazing story. I have no idea what's going on in that story. Uh -huh. it, it's, it's that referential mania, right? That's, right? that's this urge to, and he hated psychiatry, right? That was one of his driving passions. Well, he was very skeptical of Freud. He, he, he certainly liked to say that he was skeptical of Freud, um, mm -hmm. which, which would have been mainstream when, when he's writing it. Um, the, the, um, yeah, so, so he invents this diagnosis called this, this form of, I guess we could say phenomenon of referential mania where a person believes that um, everything in the world um, is a reference back to themselves, which th there's something in psychiatry called a delusion of reference or an idea of reference. And those are very much um, the same. I mean, he, he didn't, I assume he knew the true clinical term and he just decided to depart from it a little bit. And the but, benignest form, of course, is adolescence where everything uh -huh. <laughs> refers to me, so. Yes, yes, right. <laughs> well, 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 yes, you know, um, I, I mean, I think that, that, that actually, um, you know, I think that developmentally there are periods of time where the, the, um, it, it very much feels like, like that's the case, um, and, and, that, and that would be normal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there, there are reasonable philosophical challenges saying, how, how do we know that, that, that things aren't all in reference to me anyway? Like that would be, you know, a, reason, a, reason, a reasonable claim claim as well. But he captures very well that, that, that experience of, that, that people describe of the world calling out to them. And, and I, one thing I love about that text is that, that um, you know, it's truly a fictional text. He, he experienced some hallucinations, but, but nothing in his biography that I know of to suggest you know, a kind of all-encompassing, um, you know, d very disruptive beliefs like he describes the boy in, in the story. Mm -hmm. Anything captures very well, and I, and I think creates in the reader the same kind of referential mania. And that's why I think the story works so well. The, the assignment for the students for that that story is to note down what you're feeling as you're reading the story. Like it's not meant to be analytic at all, but but just um, see if you can kind of get the mood that he's trying to to create. Yeah, just track the colors in that story. Right. How many right. colors are in that story? Or right. the bird, the bird right. dying on the street. I mean, I mean. Nabokov yeah. is amazing, the stuff he comes up with, you know, like in uh, Lolita, you know, the, the whimpering uh, fire hydrant. I mean, I mean the guy is, guy is a genius and, and maddening. And um, so, so let's, let's talk a little bit about teaching and what it's like these days. 
And well, before we get into that, so here we are in this crazy time. What do you, in, in the broadest terms, what do you think is going to be taken away from this experience of the pandemic? I mean, the 50s were the age of anxiety and the the 90s were the age of Zoloft. I mean, are we in the age of Klonopin? I mean, I mean, what, I mean, right. what is going to happen as a result of this? Uh, what are the stories going to be like? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? What do you think? Oh, the, yeah. If if I if I knew, um, I mean, what, I mean, what can I add to this? One one thing that's fascinating is how like the proliferation of thoughts about it. So like. You know, I'll find a magazine um, published, say, a month ago that I don't subscribe to. Say, I'll find it online or visiting my parents or something. It's only passe. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's all gone. Yeah. Um, but then, but, or everyone seems to have passed through this period of time of, like, writers writing about what the experience is like for them. Like, it's led to this sort of explosion of analysis and awareness. I mean, the same way I think of this, like, for anyone, I mean, not, not even just as like a, a psychiatrist, but anyone interested in, in other people. Um, there's fast, it's fascinating because we're all going through a crisis of some sort and different sides of our personality are being brought out, different relationships are being brought out. Like there's so much human material. There's so much life suddenly going on. I, I think that there's a general sense. I felt it. I think a lot of people felt it that for a long time before this was happening, that a lot of people were sort of in their, um, sort of in their rut maybe one could say you know in their track and moving going forward and heading off in in a particular direction um without that much introspection or stop mindfulness or looking around at the world and just being thrown from that all of a sudden has made all of us just wonder about um what's going on I mean, you know that's why i say i was working on this novel and um the novel is actually be a contemporary novel which is something very new for me um and of course, the danger of writing anything contemporary is that something even more contemporary will like jump up and and right, right. And, and ask and ask for your attention. Um, and and especially now with an with an event like this, which is so hard to sort of process and and understand. Um, I guess the, the the big thing I'm impressed by is just the diversity of of experiences. And I've I've noticed this talking to some of the students in the class and and hearing from colleagues um, you know, who who talk about the experiences that their patients are having. Um, and that is that, like there's a, there's a lot of anxiety, but it's about different things. Um, and then there's also a certain number of people who, um, for whom the old way of doing things wasn't working, um, and, and and some kind of disruption or or change to that um, has also has brought a, about a certain kind of optimism that wasn't there beforehand. Uh, well, I think are, are we still waiting for the great 9/11 story? Has that, has that been written yet? Uh, it took 110 years for the great World War I novel to be written by, by you, Daniel. Uh, you yeah. think of what Tim O'Brien did uh, about the Vietnam War, uh, PTSD, that took a long time to process. Um, he's still not done with it. I mean, and those experiences of uh, these life-changing, uh, epic, epoch-changing kind of experiences, we may, not, we may not ever be in control of. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe this is an example of that. Maybe it's as simple as we're being reminded of every minute of our mortality, our vulnerability. And we see that on TV. We see that uh, going to the grocery store. So that's why you, you did that wonderful assignment for your, your, your kids at Stanford. Uh, that wonderful essay, wonderful piece you had in the New York Times, How a College Final Became a Lesson in Survival. Can, can you talk about that in case some people missed that, which they shouldn't have missed? Sure, sure. That was like one of my great, mo my sort of like, I don't know, most inspiring moments of, of, of most memorable moments, I could say, of teaching. Well, um, so that I, I had this class, so, you know, we talk about being worried and, 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 and what keeps one up at night. Um, I'm much more concerned, and I say this on a day where, where it's 95 degrees in the Bay Area, you know, I'm much more concerned about climate change than, um, than I am about the, the pandemic. I mean, I don't want to rank, rank tragedies in the world, but um, I, I have a general sense that this will pass. It's like, um, it, if, if we're to believe some of the, the science that we're told. But, 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 but climate change is, is certainly more concerning um, 
for me at least, and it seems more formidable, um, motivating people to do something about it, it seems much harder than um, motivating them to do something about COVID. And so um, I think that also on a personal level, I love the outdoors, love the outdoors more and more as I get older. And, um, and find that, you know, you talk about reading and writing for one's mental health. I find that it's sort of inequivocally for me, and then now there's data suggesting this for other people, that uh, just simply the fact of being around green space and being in the outdoors um, has a profound antidepressant, anxiolytic, um, sort of pro-attentional effect. Uh, and, and so, you know, and it, the, it, perhaps one of the reasons why we're seeing such high levels of depression and anxiety, particularly among college students and younger younger people um, is the sort of omnipresence of, of screens and, 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 and the absence of green space around them. And so sort of over the course of the quarter, what I ended up doing, this is, this is before COVID started, is I'd include in each lecture some images that, that I had just taken of photographs from the woods, knowing that the students don't have cars, they kind of can't get out. And so um, and there's plenty of green space around Stanford, but, but I would go and I'd I'd be in the woods, I'd take pictures of mushrooms and slime molds and plants and slugs and stuff mm -hmm. and, and ferns and I'd show it to them. So it became a regular theme and, and about halfway through the class when I got feedback from them, um, you know, most like Nabokov, um, most like Virginia Woolf, um, but they all like the mushrooms and the slime hole. So um, the worst thing you can do is encourage a photographer to show them more of your photograph, right? <laughs> So then I started to do this more, more and more, and it became kind of like a, a theme, sort of a joke, even an inside joke for the class. And then, um, and then it became apparent that the, the epidemic had, had spread here and was and was worsening here, and so um, it wasn't clear what was going to happen on campus. And increasingly, you know, like I recorded a lecture, um, so some so students who were sick wouldn't have to come, and then eventually said that everyone should stay home and then the university says everyone should stay home and sort of this increasing distancing. And I had this whole final exam planned. The course is very final heavy. Like, like I, the, t the quizzes are hard because I kind of believe in hard quizzes. It's good to have a little bit of fear motivating, motivating you throughout the course of a quarter. Um, and then my hope is that students can kind of redeem themselves on, on, on a final. And now everyone was talking about there'd be no final and I had students writing with personal circumstances that sounded really difficult. It felt like giving a final was just gonna be um, sort of an act, an act of sadism to, to sort of force them in a basement somewhere at a friend's house to st now study for this test where all these scary things are going on. So I ended up just dropping the final and, and, and fitting with the theme of the class, asking that they just take a picture of a natural space where they were, um, try to get outside if they couldn't get outside, take a picture out their window of the natural space and send it in. and. It, it was so, I wrote about this in the, in the time space. It was, it was such a chaotic period of time that I had forgotten that I even did this. Um, and, I, and I come home at nighttime and I see that I have all these alerts that these students have submitted assignments and I go to the, the page that we use, class website, and all of a sudden it's just like a hundred different images from, um, you know, ducks in Texas to uh, a student's snowmobile in Nome, Alaska. Um, all suddenly start populating on the page in this sort of magical way. You know, one, you know the way when you load a page with a lot of images, right, they all kind of start popping up randomly. And so it was like that. It was like all these different images, images yeah. appearing. Um, so, so I ended up writing a, about that. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful piece. Uh, so one of the things, the last thing I'll, this is the, the next to last question. No, the next to last question I'm going to ask you is, you do a million of these interviews and you're very generous with your time with, with bookstores and, and uh, all kinds of associations. Is there a question you've never been asked during an interview that you would, that you wish you had been asked? I, and I'm, I know I'm taking my life in my hands asking a psychiatrist that, but I'm going right. to ask it anyway. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly like a free, I guess psychiatrist answer is that the answer that I would come up with right now, um, it would probably be very different from the answer that I, after sort of sober reflection, I would, I would, I would come up, come up mm -hmm. on. Um, I like, and I, and I don't know if you feel the same way. Like I, I love it when, um, be, I, I love it when a, a reader asks like about a sentence uh, that always sort of, and, and, and a lot of times like a person will like, Oh, it's rare, but they'll ask about a sentence. Like how did this sentence come to be? How did you choose to use these words? That's and, and, and sometimes I'll see like, you know, 
someone else in the audience will kind of like laugh a little, like it's a weird question. But I think it's like a great question. I mean, it sounds like you think it's a great question. I is a great question. That's what we're, you write by sentences. <laughs> right, right, right. And, and, there's, and, and there's an answer for every one of them. I mean, yeah, I mean, a great day is when you've written a great sentence. Right, it's, right. It's, 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 it's fantastic. So one of the things we do with the project we've done over the years is the Joyce Carol Oates Prize winner has uh, done a residency at Cal and the English department, I've done some events at the library out here, Contra Costa County and, and around the Bay Area. We don't know what's going to happen this year upcoming. We just have no idea. Sure. We, might, we might be zooming into infinity or, or right. to the infinity. Uh, right. So we don't know. But one of the things that was a big commitment to us, for us, was uh, to teach these workshops to high school age uh, writers. So at Girls Inc. in downtown Oakland and uh, Juvenile Hall in Martinez and uh, Northgate High School in, in Concord, on Walnut Creek. And so we have a big commitment. To, we think storytelling is the foundation of a literate society and it's, this is one of the great moments for a kid that we've seen happen in real time is when their story appears in Simpsonistas, which is our anthology, which I hope you did. You get, uh, did I get it to you? Do you have it? The Simpsonistas anthology? I'm going to get it to you. Yeah, yeah I don't have yeah. it yet. Anyway, so we published this yearly anthology. And these kids, it's a life changing experience for them to be published in the same volume with Joyce Carol Oates. Uh, and I mean, and you hear this, and we have events where at the we have our, our yearly celebration and, and the, the parents of these kids reading poems uh, come up or Girls Inc. people come up and say, these kids' lives will never be the same. Mm. So, so I want to talk just a little bit about high school before I let you go. Uh, I'll, I, you can ask, ask, answer this question either way. Um, it's often said that an unhappy childhood is, is a prerequisite for being a writer. Uh -huh. So your high school experience what was that like? You can answer that question in Palo Alto, uh -huh. or, you, or you could answer this question. What do you think is a good high school experience? What would, what would be some of the signs of a good high school experience? Sure. Um, yeah, there, there's something about, um, you know, sort of this like, classic tenant right of, of, of um, psychology that, that uh, early childhood events, childhood form who we are. And I, I, like I always find in reading that literature, like there's this great interest in very early childhood. I mean, in some places, very, very early childhood, pre-speech childhood. Mm -hmm. um, the scientist in the crib childhood, right. Right, <laughs> right. But, but, I, but I feel like, um, I, I often find that a, like a lot of sort of my patterns of thinking, um, go back to high school. Um, and, you know, I, I, I went to Palo Alto High School, um, so, you know, which is this wonderful public high school, but a very well-funded public high school, um, which, which, has, which has a lot of resources and you know, did, did back then um, when, I, when I was there. Um, but at the same time, you know, my, my memory of it is, is, is of a place that was somewhat socially difficult, um, you know, like, sort of the high school kind of classic American high school in the in the in the movies it was a place that was sort of fragmented into its tribes of sorts and mm -hmm. um, it's a basic decency among the students but um, but quite a hard place to sort of feel um, comfortable um, and, um, and sort of at, and, at home really a anywhere um, and and you know I wonder I, like I wonder is that is that a requisite of the high school experience or is there something particular to the American high school experience that that seems to breed that that kind of an environment um, and, and and I don't have an answer I'm, I'm sure there's many people study high schools throughout throughout the world but I think there's something kind of you know, particularly socially intense about the, the American um, suburban high school experience that um, that that that, that forms a crucible, social crucible of sorts. Well, you know, what Harry Stack Sullivan, the great psychiatrist, said the, the, the principal project of adolescence is the avoidance of loneliness. Uh -huh. I think that sounds pretty damn true. Uh -huh. Sounds like it's on the money. Right. Well, this has been wonderful. I think everybody should uh, 
uh, Daniel Mason's has a wonderful website. You should all go there and uh, please get a copy of his new book, a Registry of My Passage Upon the Earth. And of course, the classic uh, Winter Soldier and the Piano Tuner and uh, all the wonderful books that Daniel has written. And uh, it's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much. We had to uh, evict your children from your office to do this. <laughs> they won't be scarred though. <laughs> uh, I, they evicted me. I, I, fled, to, I fled to a neighbor. <laughs> all right. Well, anything else on your mind? Anything you want to say, Daniel? No, no. We just, go? You know, just I, I'm, I'm. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful conversation, and I'm still so honored to receive this prize. And um, I'm hoping we'll get to do as many of the projects as have been planned in in years past. But um, I think one thing about the crisis is bringing out new creative ways of interacting with the world. So I think we'll be able to come up with a lot. On that positive note. I think we'll call it a day. Thank you, Daniel. We'll be in touch really soon. Maybe in 10 minutes, we'll do it again. No, we're not going to do it again. <laughs> thanks, Daniel. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Take, Take care. care. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye.